Okay, I want to find the best info pattern for honeycomb paneling. I've tried multiple times to demonstrate that hexagons are not superior to other shapes, at least structurally. I tried to demonstrate this with 2D simulations, people had issues, so I cut them out of acrylic and crushed them in a press, but people still have issues, and there's one thing that keeps being brought up, and that's honeycomb paneling. If hexagons aren't strong, then why is this used all over, especially in aerospace, where strength to weight ratio is incredibly important? How do I prove that it's because it's easy to make and not because of some inherent structural benefit of hexagons. Honeycomb infill is made by taking thin strips of material, bonding them together at alternating locations, and then stretching that out and allowing it to naturally form a honeycomb pattern. But there still isn't a great way to do that for the other tileable polygons, triangles and squares. The triangles and squares would only bond at the corners instead of along their sides like the hexagons. This reduced bond area makes the infill very weak. So here's the plan. Instead of using long, thin strips and bonding them together, we're going to break the infill into discrete closed shapes. These are then bonded along their sides instead of their points, giving us a strong, well-connected infill. This should make the infill behave more like it's cut out of one big block of material to level the playing field between squares, triangles, and hexagons. I'm going to use this technique to create identical beams, which I then crush in a three-point bend test, much like this one shown by an actual honeycomb panel manufacturer. Now, how do we actually make these? I would love to spend hours of my life cutting thin strips of aluminum, bending them into shapes, and gluing them together, but I have real work to do on real rockets, so I need something automated, like a printer, but in 3D. To make sure this would work, I printed a test version of the standard honeycomb infill out of PETG. At first, I tried to break this with my body weight, but it was extremely strong, so I took it to the metal shop and crushed it with an arbor press. I didn't have a scale, but this was a lot of force, and you can see when it breaks, it disappears in a single frame, less than a thirtieth of a second, which is insane. But once I found the pieces, I could look at how it broke. The bottom appears to have ripped apart in tension and the cracks spread without necessarily following the layer lines, which is great news for the test. And you can see on the inside that the cracks then went through the thinner honeycomb and it also didn't delaminate. So now it's time to print another hexagon, a triangle, a square, and a secret bonus sample. While those were printing, I got started on an improved test fixture, starting with some round scrap material to make a smoother pushing surface for the press. This should keep the press from digging into the top plate and damaging it, giving us more consistent results. I cleaned up the ends in the lathe, and then I milled a flat to press against, which will keep it from rolling. I also made a base out of wood to keep the spacing consistent. This doesn't need to be as perfect as the press head because it's further from the point of failure. It just needs to be narrow enough that the panel can't bend and slip in between the supports. Also, yes, while this is a test of 3D printed infill, it is not a test of 3D printer infill. 3D print infill is actually much more complicated than what I'm doing. You have to optimize for reducing material, maximizing strength, maximizing layer adhesion, also supporting the upper surface, and it's all complicated by the fact that you can pick any pattern because it's 3D printed. I'm trying to do something that at least conceivably could be mass produced like honeycomb infill out of metallic materials. That's why I did double layer infill, which would be a complete waste of material on actual 3D prints. After a couple of failed prints, I finally got a complete set of panels, which all used almost exactly 70 grams of filament. This time, because the walls of the infill are exactly two layers thick, I had to adjust the density by scaling the shapes rather than thickening them. I found an add-in for on shape called Grid Extrude, which made this super easy to model. In the last video, I was just using linear patterns, which was awful. And speaking of tedious tasks, I no longer have to manually track the force on the scale. Last time, I just filmed the display of the scale and then added the force to a spreadsheet by hand. But this was slow, and I found out that the display was quite laggy. Also, because it takes some time for the last number to fade, it would often overlap and be unreadable until the force settled out. To fix this, I dug up my old Arduino, cracked open the scale, and connected it to an old amplifier circuit I made way back in college. This way, I could record the load cell data directly to a laptop. And finally, it's time to watch some slow motion destruction.
Once again, I used Tracker to measure displacement so I could create a force versus displacement plot and compare the samples. And this is what I found. They're all almost identical. Okay, so before someone mentions that yes, hexagons technically broke at the highest force, but they were only about 1% above triangles. That's definitely just in the noise at this point. If I didn't feel so guilty about wasting this much plastic, I could print a few more samples to get a better idea of the distribution, but they're already so close that we can safely say that hexagons don't necessarily give you an edge. And just to solidify that, let's look at the bonus sample. Again, this used the same amount of material, but it was made with circular columns that were completely disconnected. This should have the same compressive strength, but basically no shear strength. This is a reference point, sort of a control, to see how much the infill pattern is actually contributing to the strength of these beams. And it was noticeably weaker. When I plot it against the other samples, you can clearly see that any kind of connected infill, regardless of shape, is going to give you about a 350% increase in your ultimate strength. At least for this configuration. Whether this would hold for something like aluminum honeycomb or aluminum composite honeycomb is another question entirely. Especially because the infill there is much thinner relative to the thickness of the plates. But at this point, I think I've demonstrated that even in this application, where we actually see hexagons used in the real world, it's not because they're a strong shape or have better strength to weight ratio. It really is because they're the easiest infill pattern to mass produce. And with that, I'm Con Hathi, and I'll see you in the next video.